Happy Monday, everybody. It's time for another edition of Ask Mike. Courtney Mims alongside Mike Irwin here. Mike, we have to jump right into things because, as always, after a Razorback loss, I feel like we have 100 questions <laughs> to get to. Right. There are a lot of people who have a lot of questions, and that makes sense. So let's get right into it. Our first question is from Dr. Starks, who says, Pittman has mentioned needing to fix the penalty issue after several games dating back to last year. Can someone with access ask what he does specifically to try and fix them? Is it talking about them, film study on them, conditioning, or some other form of physical consequence for them? Yeah, it's not that complicated. He answered that question last week. We ask it again just to be sure. Basically, you had two different issues, one week to the next, but last week it was uh, holding penalties. And you get them out there and, and you do blocking drills where they've got to block somebody with that. But look, here's the problem with anything that you do like that in practice. It's still not a game. You can work on it. Doesn't mean you simulate it exactly the conditions you would be in under a game uh, situation. But I will say that they did a really good job of reducing the number of holding penalties this week. I don't know, it might have been two. There were a whole bunch of them last week. This week was a different issue. It was uh, due to the noise at the stadium, so you had false starts. They worked on that all week long. You get in the walker indoor, you crank up the sound, you have guys line up and you're doing the snap count. Let me explain something to you. That's not a game. That's not like being out in Death Valley, 95,000. You were down there. It's, I don't know if you were on the that. field, but <laughs> it's just unbelievable how loud it is down there. It's 100,000 people and in you're there, trying to, you're trying to, uh, you know, the game's on the line. You're on the offensive line. You want to get off as quick as possible, and they're jumping around. So you do those things. You know, you do work on those things in practice, but it doesn't always translate. But I will say that at least working on the holding thing from one week to the next, for you people that are constantly criticizing and saying this staff doesn't know what they're doing, they did a miraculous job, in my opinion, of correcting the holding penalty issue. They just ran into a new issue this week. Yeah. And I think a lot of teams that go into Death Valley, it happens at Georgia, Alabama, places like that where there are 100,000 and it's very loud, you're going to run into that. And you cannot simulate that even if you try. And they did everything they could because that Walker Indoor was very loud. When they pump that crowd sound in, it does get pretty but loud in there. what they can't simulate is ga the game's on the line. Exactly. Psychologically, when you're out there in a game and it's on the line like it was, and that's where some of those false starts happen late in the third quarter. Yeah, it was in the fourth, second half. Fourth, fourth quarter when the game is on the line. There's a psychological thing with every athlete out there. You're, you're more jittery. You're more like, ooh, i got to make this happen. And you, you don't simulate that by sitting there at the Walker Indoor on a Tuesday <laughs> going, oh, the, this is a critical situation. I've got to convince myself. You just It doesn't work that way. It doesn't. And they had five false starts in that second half. And you could tell there was a difference, Mike, between the crowd atmosphere in that first half versus the second exactly. half. Because I couldn't – I could actually hear – People next to me talked to me in that first half. In the second half, I couldn't hear the guy next to me. It was sure. it was crazy. So, again, I do think they're working on them and, and they're trying their best to simulate those atmospheres, but you always just can't simulate the real thing. The Bionic Pig says, Texas A&M rush defense is elite. I believe no team has cracked 100 yards rushing in four games. Do you believe Arkansas can win as one-dimensional offense? Well, first of all, there have been two teams that have gone over 100 yards against them, including Auburn, which I think had about 130 this past week. So that's not true. But they are averaging giving up a little over 100 yards rushing a game. Uh, but when I, and I've watched A&M, I've watched LSU. I'm just telling you, A&M's defense is the best part of what they do. But I think LSU's defense is just as good, and Arkansas actually ran for 177 yards. You, you have to subscribe, uh, subtract all those lost yardage plays where K.J. is sacked. But they rushed, actually ran for 177 yards against these guys. So, and they got nine first downs running. So they've moved forward, a, took a big step moving forward. And then when you start talking about we, being one-dimensional, okay, uh, they limited, a ms defense limited Miami to 77 yards rushing, and they gave up almost 50 points to Miami. You know why? Because Miami threw the fool out of the ball and had over 400 yards passing. Yeah. So if they do that, 
And if Arkansas can't run the ball, they will throw it. And I'm much more encouraged about the passing offense now that they've tweaked some things. Cotton KJ, instead of standing as a stationary target, gotten him moving around a little bit, and he throws the ball better that way. So I'm pretty optimistic that they can move the ball against A&M after watching them move the ball. They punted one time in that game. <laughs> I mean, if you had told me going into that, uh, into that LSU game that Arkansas would punt one time, I'd be, what? You're nuts. So there was a big improvement this week. And Absolutely. I think it will translate to the A&M game. And with the offensive line, too. I know a lot of people, you know, want to forget the issues that they were having in the first three weeks. But I was really optimistic big, about those guys. Big, change. Big change. Huge change. I mean, it does give you some confidence going into that game that you know Arkansas – has improved on offense, and I think we have a question about that improvement on offense coming up in just a second. But S. Giles wants to know, does it bother you that so many Arkansas fans are unwilling to acknowledge, oh, look at this, the question I was talking about, the offensive improvement from the first three games. I was encouraged by K.J. and the receivers, the O-line and the play calling. They took a big step forward. Uh, you know, it doesn't bother me because I understand social media. I, under I understand that there is a group of people out there. I don't know how large of a contingent this is, but they never wanted Sam Pittman hired in the first place. They saw him as a career O-line coach. you got to get a proven head coach. They don't want an O-line coach as a head coach. They want somebody that was a quarterback's coach, an offensive coordinator, all this stuff. So they're going to continue to scrutinize no matter what happens. So that part of it didn't bother me. But S. Giles is correct. There was a huge difference between – and, you know, you, DJ does his breakdown every week yeah. for, for us to, on the game day show. And I don't know if you remember it, but when – I have to I, do, I do remember. I have to analyze it after he – after he runs it, then they, he asked me, what do you think about that? And I just shook my head. I'm like, you, why did you do that to me? Because I now have no faith that this team could score points this year because it was so bad last week against BYU with the O-line. I'm thinking, I've never seen it this bad. I am just shocked. I'm sitting there watching in the second half against LSU, and I'm watching Arkansas get a bunch of those nine first downs that they got, and I'm seeing an offensive push by the, by the offensive linemen. I'm seeing guys make first downs where they couldn't even get two yards, one yard. You know, remember the first down they couldn't make, and everybody was saying, you've got to have him up under center. Well, they didn't need to no, have they him didn't up need center. To do they, that. they were still making first downs like that. So... You know, you can criticize the O-line coach. You can criticize Sam Pittman. How do you ever get himself in this position if he's an O-line guy himself? You can criticize them last week. I did. But come on. If you see, if you sit and watch the big change from one week to the next, give credit to that. Acknowledge that instead of getting back on, the, on Twitter again and acting like none of that ever happened. If you want to criticize this team for the penalties that continued, some of the other things that happened in the game, fine. But you've got to at some point acknowledge the big change in the offense because you and me and a lot of others were criticizing them last week. Absolutely. And I've got to say that I was just flabbergasted. I was sitting there going, I can't believe I'm seeing this. I don't, I don't believe you can make that much of a change in one week, but they did. Yeah, and that's I, you've got to credit Sam Pittman on that too because we said it on this show. We think he's going to work with the offensive line a little bit more, and he must have. I mean, that change, I feel like that's where you see Sam Pittman. That's where you see the offensive the line whole, coach I think mentality. they tweaked the entire offense. I yeah. think. I think uh, Enos' play calling was different. They were moving K.J. around, he letting him be himself again. And the overall effect of that was one of the biggest turnarounds one week to the next I've ever seen. Well, if they play like that, if the offense plays like that and this, you know, this stretch going up against Texas A&M and Ole Miss and Alabama, they really do have a shot to win I, all those games. Yeah, I do. I, it's going to be tough, but I think I think I agree with you. Yeah, they just they got to bring like bring that out in those games as well. Big Daddy Kane points out against BYU, the number of penalties seemed to increase in the fourth quarter. The same against LSU. Is it fatigue causing the increase at the end of the game? I think we've already talked about it. it's not fatigue. In the first game, we're talking uh, holding penalties. And most of those holding penalties came on that last drive. What are you doing there? You're desperate. you got to get down there and figure it out, and you don't have much time. Uh, BYU knew Arkansas was going to do nothing but throw the ball so you can just forget everything else and send a, a blitz every time. Arkansas's old linemen know that's coming. you got to do anything in the world to keep K.J. from getting sacked because if he does, that allows the clock to burn and you're dead. 
So I think that caused some of those holding penalties. It wasn't fatigue. I think it was the desperation in the situation they were in. Now, late penalties on the false start, you already mentioned it. It got louder as the game went along. And in the fourth quarter, when that game is really on the line, and every time LSU scored, Arkansas came back and answered, I think their fans got louder and louder and louder. And then their players, and I'm convinced it was a pregame strategy, they started doing those hard shifts. They're down linemen in the pre-snap. And again, if you stick a guy out there, I, I, just, you know, I always like to give personal examples, but when, when I was in high school, I played typically in front of about 2,500, 3,000 people. Wow. I remember one night we went out, to, went to, over to Denver City and had a crowd of 7,000 there. I never played in front of that many people before. We had pre-snap false starts because it was just louder than what we were used to. And it's not just how loud it is. It's combining with you're, you're, over, you're over anxious. You want to get off the line of scrimmage as fast as possible. And unless you've been in that situation, you don't understand how difficult it is not to false start, mm -hmm. especially when you get a team that's jumping around like that. So that's why that happened late. It was a combination of two different things, false start penalties, holding penalties, not the same thing. Yeah, I agree completely. You had two different situations, and you're like, like you said, BYU was the desperation. It was like, we have to do something. We have to get this done, and that's why it was like, you know, you kind of lose the yeah. discipline, right? And, and you go grabbing. into, and you're grabbing, and you're going into that mindset of, I got to do something. Most I got to make a play. Holding, everybody holds at the beginning. I'm yeah. telling you, they all do. You're grabbing inside, <laughs> but the what the refs are looking for is when that player tries to pull away from you, if you continue to hang on to him, that's when you're going to get, and they have to have the discipline to learn to release and then start using their hands. Exactly, but they did. I mean, I, we talked about it, but they did in this LSU game. Yeah, it's just... You go from a hold to a push, and <laughs> you've got to learn to do that. Absolutely. I, I love, though, the fact that you did see the change in those penalties, hopefully, yeah. we see the change going into Texas A&M. I'm going to predict there will be way fewer penalties against A&M. We'll see. Ooh, but you, I like you're it. not going to. Uh, Jerry World is nowhere near as loud as Death Valley. I promise you, uh, it's not. Yeah. Uh, well, even I went last year, so I know. Even though it's indoors, it's nowhere near as loud, and it's going to be about half Arkansas fans in there. So it's a totally different circumstance. I think they've solved the holding problem. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we'll see the, the false starts either. So hopefully the penalties won't. Because I will agree. I understand why these people are frustrated. You take away those penalties and Arkansas wins both of those games. Absolutely. It was penalties, penalties, penalties. It's just you bang your head against the wall because you're just like, if those weren't there. Yep. They would have won. I really, truly believe that as well, Mike. Um, I like this comment because this is from our meteorologist, uh, Josh Rugger, who's on the morning show here at KNWA. He said on Twitter or X, whatever we're calling that now, Twitter slash X, just got to say, it's wild to me how a few Hog fans act like we just played two bad teams over the last couple of weeks and lost. We will not play a better team than LSU the rest of the season. Season hashtag Woo Pig Suey. Yeah, I was reading that uh, at night after I got back home yeah. that night. I was reading that and I responded to it because oh, okay. I was thinking that myself. It had kind of been rolling through my head. Now, look, I watch a lot of replays when I get home in the mornings before I come to work. A lot of these games are on replay. So I've watched most SEC teams this year, and I, you know, it can change week to week. I freely acknowledge that. But right now, I would tell you, I think the best team in the SEC is Georgia. I would put LSU next and then Florida right after them. So those are your three teams. You put Florida right after They're them? They're playing really well okay. right now. Okay, all right. The, and then you got a kind of bunch of them in the middle, and then I don't think anybody's just really – maybe Mississippi State's bad. Missouri's better this year. <laughs> Missouri so, is better this year, yeah. uh, You know, it, so I responded to what he said because I agree with that right now. Now, it could change next week. But what I saw, especially with the, what they did in that game offensively, they were near perfect in the second half. And you've got to acknowledge what the opponent is doing. You can't always look at a game just from the standpoint of your own players, your own team. you got to look at what's being done on the other side of the ball and acknowledge it was near perfection. The year LSU won the national championship, that's what their offense looked like. Mm -hmm. you know. So I was impressed, and so I responded to that. What, and you responded with that statement yes, right there? Yes, I agree with you, 100%. I like that. I'm, just, I'm really shocked, Mike. You just said you went Georgia first, LSU second. I agree with you on both of those. And then Florida third. 
Well, they bounced I, back from that one embarrassing loss and they're yeah, looking to better. Utah, yeah. I mean, I don't, I, and it wasn't embarrassing. I mean, Utah's Well, good. Utah was ranked as well, so yeah, yeah. So, but, you know, and things can change early in the year. But just like people th thought LSU was dog poop because they lost to Florida State, well, they, they, they had a lot of drop balls. They, they sort of look like in the second half against Florida State the way they did on the first two possessions against Arkansas. Exactly. So LSU is being inconsistent, but when they're playing well, they're as good as anybody in the SEC. And it's funny that fans thought that they were bad after FSU because it's so quick that we forget FSU coming into the season was highly, highly mm -hmm. respected as right. a very good team in the entire uh, world of college football. And we know Alyssa Orange over here, she's an FSU alum. But she would, I mean, we so talked about it. So you guys somewhere it. eating lunch watching that game? We were. We were somewhere eating lunch uh, watching that FSU I Clemson figured game. She's probably in there screaming and making everybody mad in the <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> she was uh, definitely screaming loud, I'll tell you that. you probably that. had a bet placed on the game. And so if you were coming out with making some money, you were screaming too. Mike, I don't bet on FSU and I don't like Clemson <laughs> either. So I can't bet on either okay. of those because I don't, you don't like either of those You bet on teams you like. You're just trying to make money. I know, but I don't like betting on teams I don't okay. like because I root for both of them to lose you know I don't I know, that, I know that can't happen but I rooted for both of them to lose anyways moving on from that Chad Urig says the same old talking heads are starting to mix up the Kool-Aid again already in Arkansas okay, he, he tweeted that at me <laughs> he but, did yes because after I tweeted retweeted what Josh put up and said I agreed with him then he came back and so that's squarely at me okay and I wanted a chance to respond to that because here's what I would say this is the one thing about social media that always strikes me, is when you're talking about, you're making, you're coming to conclusions about people's motives when you don't know them. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have a problem with you giving specific examples of what you thought some player didn't do this, some coach didn't do that. Me too. But when you give Sam Pittman certain motivations and you don't know him, I, I'm against that. When you give attach cer certain motivations to players when you don't know them. Like Nick Smith Jr. stuff last exactly. year. Yeah. So here's a guy that doesn't know me but says I was mixing up Kool-Aid. Let me try to explain this to you. Uh, I learned journalism from my dad. He was a weekly newspaper guy. And I once stood there when I was about eight years old and watched him talk about this to somebody that had come in to, to complain. And he said that... Publishing a, sm a, a small town newspaper, a weekly newspaper, is the toughest job in journalism because every single person that you put in your newspaper that you do a story you know. about, you know them. <laughs> so I've always taken that to heart. So, for instance, let's say I don't like a guy. Am I going to slant my story because I don't like him? No, I've got to take that out of it. Let's say I do like a guy, and I like Sam Pittman. So I'm going to defend Sam Pittman because I like him? No, no, I don't do that. I look for specific situations. That tweet was what I believe at this moment. I can be wrong. Everybody can be wrong. But right now, I didn't post that for any Kool-Aid mixing or anything like that. At the moment, I believe LSU is the best team in the SEC behind Georgia and the yeah. best team Arkansas will play. We will see if I'm right about that, but it got nothing to do with Kool-Aid. I, I absolutely agree with you, and I'm, I sit here because there's a lot of people, and I go through, because I look at the comments. I also read what people are saying about you and me, Mike, on the YouTube as well, and I go through and I see what they're saying, and they, you know, sometimes they say, oh, you guys are just defenders of the university, yeah. and I, and I have not. to say, we're not. We're not <laughs> defenders of the university, but, you know, to, to stick up for what you just said there, I have heard you criticize Sam Pittman, that people, uh, that, you know, things that are uh, decisions that are made in games. I've heard you criticize other sports and other coaches. Kendall Bryles, I've heard, Enos. Enos, everybody. And just because you may not see it on social media or you may not see it in this show specifically doesn't mean it's not happening. We also have KNWA and KARK that we're on that we hear you, the Pig Trail Show, every Sunday night. There are other places. Just because you're only seeing Mike and I talk here doesn't mean that we're not criticizing things in other places. I've been critical I will say that. on this show. I know I was you last have. week. We we got uh, the, we were there were so many people that said we were glossing over, and I'm going, are you kidding me? Well, I went after Enos. I went after Pittman. Went after the penalties, the play calling. I know. I, I, short 
short of calling for somebody to be fired, which we didn't do, yes. which I've never in my career done, all those people that said I was trying to get Houston up fired years ago, I never tried that in my life. I never said anything. All I did in that situation up to today covering a football team is just to use specific examples saying, hey, this happened. This sort of indicates this is going on. But you decide for yourself what you want to believe. But I'm putting this in front of you, and you decide what to do with it. Because that's what my dad always believed. He said, you don't, you don't editorialize. You just take examples of what you're talking about and put it out there and let people go with it, you know, interpret it however they want to interpret it. Absolutely. That's great advice. Moving on from that, though, because we have more questions to get to. Uh, I believe we are on Twitter, on Hogville. D-line is not very good. All the hype they got before the season and after four games, they cannot generate a pass rush. No edge rusher at all. Ooh, that's, See, that's a complete it. exaggeration. I, okay. I don't think that's a good take. I'm s and sorry. It, the reason I say that is because if you take the LSU game out of the mix, I'm not saying that D-line has been what everybody thought it would be. I agree. We thought it was going to be, there was going to be a better pass rush than there was. So it's been somewhat disappointing. But it, to just say they've done nothing, they've had sacks, they've had thrown for lost plays. What happened in this game goes back to what I said before. They ran up against the best offense they've seen all year. Yes. And, and you've got to acknowledge who you're playing. That offense in the second half was as perfect as I've seen an offense be. They did not make mistakes. They didn't open the, open the door for you to take advantage of what they were doing. And so I think that's why that D-line didn't do what you wanted them to do. That doesn't mean that that's what they are for the rest of the season. It's not what they were going into this game. It's not what they'll be moving forward. Again, I freely acknowledge they're not just out there sacking a the quarterback every time you turn around. And we, 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 some people might have thought that's Is that what, what they was, wanted? Is that what the well, people wanted? there was yeah, a I lot of so. talk about that. I don't okay. think I ever said that. But I don't think you are right. We felt so like the pass rush would be better because of the reputation of the, of, of the defensive coordinator. He had a reputation of being able to do this. Yeah. And that's what we talked about was, was he is, T. Wells' rep, reputation. And I still think it's improved from last year. I don't think anybody with a, that's being objective will try to sit here and convince you this isn't a better defense than it was a year ago. This game was different. That's what I said after the show, too, because a lot of people say, well, Courtney, the defense, the defense, they're, they're, they, look, they didn't look great in that second half. The first half, they were disrupting Jaden Daniels a bit. They were making it the difficult. Pick, the yes, pick. they were disrupting him. You could see it in that first half. LSU went into that locker room, and every defensive player on this team will tell you they made the correct adjustments to combat what we were doing. Exactly. And that's what happened. They were not... Now, say what you will, but they were playing perfect in that second half. That it's offense just, was firing. It's as good as I've seen in a long time. That offense was firing in all cylinders. They went into the locker room. They adjusted. And that defense, it gave the defense fits. But that was the first time they had seen that this year. I that was the first these time. Words, but I don't think A&M can do that. Even with Ooh. Petrino calling plays. I don't know. I don't, okay. Not like that. Okay. Okay. Oh. That's bold statement there, Mike. That is a bold statement there. I, I'm telling you, LSU is better than a I, LSU is better. better. LSU is better. And LSU's offense this year, I think, is better than a and for sure. But we'll see what happens in that game. I don't like betting against Petrino. That makes me a little scared. But you know how I feel about that from last year. Rebellious Hog says, if someone keeps whining, this team sucks, the coach sucks, KJ sucks, that is bad-mouthing. If someone points out that the O-line is playing less than optimal because of pre-snap penalties, that is a critical comment. He goes on to say, uh, being critical does not always equate being negative or bad-mouthing. Well, it's sad that he has to point something as logical as this Very out. Very logical, yeah. But it's true, and it's true in both ways to both different groups of fans, to fans who are overly critical and fans who never criticize. What I would say to you fans who believe you can, you should never criticize, you're, that's unrealistic. All fans should have a critical eye. And you should not confuse somebody that's using good examples of why they're, a proper way to get on social media is to, to, to say, hey, 
you know, this happened, this happened, and this is why I think this was bad, because this happened. You're giving examples. If you just say that Sam is old and fat and stupid and it should have never been hired in the first place, that's re that's brain-dead criticism. You're just throwing stuff out there. But that's what's been on social media. That's what Sam Pittman, you know, said in his press conference today. I just was tired of seeing it. I was tired of seeing people come for my players and not... It, it, there's constructive criticism, and then there's just yeah. stupid criticism. Again, I've, I've sort of several times on here defended fans in, on social you medias. Have. Because I do believe you should have freedom of speech, and you can put out there. And it does not bother me when they do that kind of stuff, even when they direct it at me. Because I just look at it and go, is this criticism valid? Well, it's not. I don't care then. But the point is... It's been a little bit different. You got to know that, and you know how I know yeah. it because the players are starting to 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 go back against this, to push back. Players don't generally do that. When KJ Jefferson does what he did, mm -hmm. and he was basically saying, "Hey, uh, you think we're not getting the job done, and we're poorly coached, and our coach doesn't know what he's doing? Okay, I invite you to come out here and do this yourself, and, and we'll win some games." Mm -hmm. That's what he's basically he's pushing back against this. And I would, you, it's not going to affect these people, I promise you, but I just will point out to those that are a little more objective, when social media reaches a point where you start getting player pushback, like remember with the baseball team when the transfer catcher Ooh, that was, that, yeah, went, went yeah. back against a criticism of him when they accused him of just being a renter player, you can cross the line on this stuff. And, and when you get push back from players you that's a generally a good sign that wait a minute this is getting a little crazy well even like Dave Van Horn kind of made some comments about it too yeah. so uh, I, again I don't expect it to change but I will say this and I think I made this point last week I I went back to that 2014 LSU game in which Arkansas had, had a, a four and eight season a three and nine season and now they were four and five Ugh. and so that's three straight years of frustration and Arkansas breaks a I don't know, a 13-game SEC losing streak, and the fans storm the field. Do you think they would storm the field for a team that was 5-5 five and five now? They wouldn't because that's the change in the fan base from back then to now. I don't know how it's happened, why it's happened, and I, even though I will defend your right to do this, here's one other point I want to make. As long as fan, all this stuff about get rid of Sam Pittman, that doesn't affect me because I know Hunter, Hunter Urechek, and he's not going to do that mm -mm. just because you say that he should do it. You're not going to pressure him into that. But here's what they did do. They got rid of Bryles. They did. I think Kendall Bryles wanted to stay here. I think his family liked him. But I think he put the word out with his agent last year, I, we need to look around because he got tired of it. Mm -hmm. And when you bend to that pressure and you – you, you let them win when you do that. And I'm not saying that wasn't a good move. Maybe long term it will be. But the issues that, K, that KJ was dealing with are a direct result of you pressure Bryles out of here, then you get a new guy, and now you're all over him again. Yeah. A, and you just can't keep changing stuff like that over and over and over again. Yeah. So there is a danger if you let the social media get to you. And you shouldn't do it if you're, if, if you're a player. You shouldn't do it as if you're a coach or somebody in the media. You well, should understand what it is. Well, that's why when Sam Pittman, you know, and the, the deactivation of the Twitter account last week, right? Remember when that was all yes. going around? I mean, it makes sense because you're saying, I don't want to deal with it, right? Set an example for your players. And they got furious players. about it. So many people did, and I'm thinking, why? Why? Why, is it, why do why you does care? That, why does it matter? Are you mad because he now won't read the stuff you <laughs> wanted to post there? You don't have that outlet? To I mean, go, I you, think that's better that he doesn't read that stuff. Push it out. Get it. Block yeah, it out. I don't care whether a coach is on so everybody's like, well, Muscle Nick Saban Mus isn't on Twitter. Must Mus really uses that for recruiting. Okay, do you think that Pittman can't recruit if he doesn't have a Twitter account? I uh, mean, come on. No, that's ridiculous. Nick Saban doesn't have a Twitter account. Yeah. Do you do you think that affects his recruiting? <laughs> I don't think so. It's uh, Nick Saban. So, uh, again, I digress. But let's move on to the next question, which is from Razor Alex, 88, on Hogville. I was pretty impressed with Dominion. Wish we could see more of Dominic Johnson. I am encouraged that the guys didn't let go of the rope after last weekend and played a really good game against a really good LSU team. They go on to say we may just sneak a win over A&M or Ole Miss or both. 
I may be a little overly optimistic on that one. Yeah, again, I think what they're doing with the running backs with Rocket out, and we don't know as we tape this show what's going on with him. That He's in the same situation we, he was last week. Yeah. They, they, they're going to look at him in practice and evaluate him just like they did. Nobody knows what the injury is. There's been speculation, and I believe this, that he got scoped, hmm. that he had loose cartilage in his knee, hmm. and they go in with a little yeah, puncture and they, thing yeah. and they suck it out. And it's generally a two to three to four week rehab, yeah. depending on the individual. And so this looks like what that is. A lot of people are frustrated and saying, oh, why don't you just come out and say he's never coming back this year. He's, I, he's done. I don't think he's because not coming. I don't coming. think he's done. No, he's not done. No, but I don't think he's in done. In the absence of Rocket, I think what, what the coaches are doing, is it's just like trial and error. Okay, we got A.J. Green out there. Okay, he did all right, but wait a minute. He's not doing well in this game. Let's put DeBinion. Okay, DeBinion's hot. So DeBinion probably starts this week unless Rocket comes back, and then we'll see if somebody else is hot. So that's why you've... You know, you. I think when when the running game was working last year and the year before, they were much more flexible and able to use different running backs. I think right now they're just trying to find one that works. Yeah, and so. they did put uh, Dominic in uh, to for Razor Alex eighty eight there. I believe they yeah, did. Put, was, I was, saw him in there a few times on different plays and trying to get something going there for the running game. And I, you know, maybe that's a good sign that. We will see him a little bit but more. He, he points to what, what's coming up and, yeah. and saying he may be overly optimistic about winning all of the or, or two or three of those games. And maybe so, but I think they can win every one of them if they play the way they did against LSU. I just yeah. don't know if they'll do that or not. You're with Sam Pittman there. You're like, yep, we're going to win them all. That's <laughs> I like it, Mike. Blood Red Hog asks, please tell me why no timeouts. Um, and LSU on the six-yard line and only 144 on the clock. Sam didn't tell his defense to let LSU score. This was our only chance except for some miracle block field goal. I've seen Bill Belichick and other coaches do this when necessary. Okay. I believe that's the end of the question. Yeah, yeah. Sam addressed that after the game, and he, and he made a lot of people mad, but he said – because I didn't think they would try to score. Yeah. And if they're not trying to score, our only option at that point is to try and force a turnover. So I told our guys, go ahead and be aggressive on defense, go after the ball and try to get a turnover. Then what happened was Brian Kelly came back and addressed that himself, and he said, we had no intention of scoring. We, we, and, and you, why, what, why would he? He's just sat there and watched Arkansas answer every touchdown with a touchdown of their own. We score, they score. We score, they score. So why should he want to go ahead and score with a minute 40 left or whatever and give Arkansas a chance to score again? The deciding factor in this little controversy where people think that he should have just told them, let them score, is the fact that Arkansas had no timeouts left. That yeah. covered everything. Yeah. Brian Kelly knew that Arkansas was out of timeouts. He knew they couldn't stop the clock. He knew he could run it as long as possible and then stop it without getting a penalty, which would move back for the field goal. And so he played it perfectly. And, again, I think you don't want to accept Sam Pittman's explanation. Well, Brian Kelly said, we weren't going to we try to score. <laughs> and you're right. It was the timeout situation. That really that changed that... everything. If you've got the timeouts, then you try to, but then you try to stop them mm -hmm. because if you, can, if you can force a field goal, then you can come back easier and get another one. You don't have to go all the way down and score. Or you might score a touchdown and win the game. Exactly. But you don't have those timeouts. Yeah, that was what really burned them in this whole situation. This would have been a different answer to the question. Totally different situation. If you've got, and Brian, Ke Brian Kelly knew that, too. Oh, absolutely. He knew they were out of timeouts, so oh. there was nothing they could do. Oh, he played it how he should. Twinkie275 says on Hogfill, dang proud of our hogs. Played a great game. Got some stuff to still fix. Saw Sam in the O-line's face. Yes, again, we shot ourselves in the foot with penalties. But the non-calls that LSU was blatant about holding horse collar face mask, shoving KJ down after the play while he was getting back up, taunting our receiver. There was a whole lot of taunting in that game. Yeah. Well, that was a lot of taunting. Taunting our receiver down in his face after the tackle while he's on the ground. The interception by LSU, it might have hit the ground. And the goal line catch that was ruled short. Something has to change with the zebras, Mike. This never stops. It's never going to stop. I go, I've go. i said this many times. I go back and forth depending on how many of those type things there are in a game. I sometimes say to myself, okay, coaches aren't perfect. Athletes aren't perfect. They make mistakes. Officials make mistakes. For instance, the, the official that saw the horse collar yeah. but th didn't see the, the grabbing of the face mask. I don't know. Maybe he was just focused on one thing and didn't see the other. I don't know. You'd have to be in his head to know it. 
But the bottom line is, this was a totally different situation than those big, the big yeah. 12 refs were like, oh, that's, that's unsportsmanlike yeah, conduct. Oh that's excessive oh celebration. My, yeah. <laughs> and then in this game, you can pretty much do whatever you want. They were doing everything. They were dancing. They were jumping yeah. up in people's faces. I was like, the taunting is getting out of hand. It was just a one. real contrast to go from that big 12 <laughs> call type game. Maybe that's a difference in the officials in the two leagues. I don't know. In this game, it was sort of like, let them play. And in the other game, it was like, we're going to get involved in everything. And yeah. honestly, I'd rather let them play. Yeah, me, me as well. Let them play. Let them do their thing. And I, you know, it kind of is fun when you, you have a little bit of taunting in there, too. It gets the players going. Sure. It's, yeah. I thought as long it was as it isn't aggressive. I but thought the officiating last week was much worse than this week. Absolutely. I agree with you there. Jumping into the stands to get a hot dog. Yeah, is that <laughs> what you said, Mike? They were trying to jump in the stands to get a hot dog. I don't know. That's wild. Um, Pig's Feet says, another question here, or first question for Pig's Feet, sorry. I thought that a player who loses his helmet must stop playing immediately or will be penalized for player protection. Can you inform us to make matters worse? The player then shoved KJ back to the ground. I know the officials are blind. Okay, those are two separate issues. Yeah, the shoving of the guy, of KJ should have been a penalty. Absolutely. And I don't know why that was ignored. It shouldn't have been so that they screwed up there. The there was an, they always on TV have a, a rules person in the booth so they can ask him when there's a, a question about that. And so on this telecast, they asked their rules guy, what is the rule here? And he said and pointed out with video that the player in question who lost his helmet was in the act of making a tackle when he lost his helmet. So if you're right there about to do it, if you've got your arms around the guy, you can continue. You can't, you don't have to just let go. Yeah. If you're, if you're chasing a guy, like trying to sack a quarterback that's running around or whatever, and you lose your helmet, you got to stop. So if it, if it had been any other situation, this is where Arkansas gets a little bit unlucky because if it had been any other situation but he was already in the grasp, then there would have been a penalty. But because he was in the grasp, it wasn't called. Gotcha. And so he has to be in the act of it. If he's in the act of making the tackle, then they don't expect you to stop. But on the other hand, if you're not, then you're supposed to stop immediately. And that's why there was no penalty. But there should have been a penalty on, the, on pushing him back down after he started to get back up. Absolutely, yeah. So they missed that one. But that's interesting. I didn't realize the difference between that. Well, that I was his explanation. I'm not a rules guy. No, I, just... I know. But I saw the helmet come off, and I said the same thing as pig's feet. I go, wait, where, where, where are we? Aren't we supposed to be stopping? Or what's going yeah. on here? So I appreciate you for explaining that. And our final question of the day is from Oklahoma, who says, there was a time that head coaches got five years to install their system and cycle through the roster before being a candidate for firing. And position coaches and coordinators got at least an entire year, if not more than one. What gives with some fans thinking that there's a cheat code for this, like it's a video game? I thought we made fine progress versus LSU thoughts. Yeah, Oklahoma is a moderator on Hogville. I one like Oklahoma. One of the better posters on there. He, I wish he would ask more questions. Yeah. I agree with him 100%. Um, he, you can call for Sam Pittman to be fired. You can say get rid of Enos now. There were people trying to make the point that the O-line coach should be fired right now and Pittman should just go over there and take his job and tell him to go away or at least put a grad assistant in charge of the O-line. A, a, a grad assistant? Yeah, that's oh, what they, was, they were saying. He's going to put a grad assistant in charge and then Pittman will basically do it. Um, that You can say all that all you want. It's not going to happen. No. It's just not going to happen. That's, that's the no. bottom line on that. So thanks for pointing that out. But again, that's, that's the mentality of some people. I go back to what I said before. Some people start the season still mad that he was hired in the first place mm -hmm. four seasons ago. Yeah. They've wanted him gone since then. So anything that happens is going to relate to that. But that is being oblivious to the relationship he has with the guy who hired him. Mm -hmm. Because Hunter Juracek is the only guy that's going to fire him, unless they fire Hunter Juracek at the Board of Trustees. Went, We're going to get rid of your AD so we can get rid of Pittman. I, I suppose that could happen, but that's not going to happen either. So it's not going to do you any good to sit here and demand that he, because I know Juracek well enough to know he's not going to sit there and read social media and go, all these fans want him fired. I guess I have to fire him. No, he's not going to happen. No, no AD is going to do that. And if we they know have the Pittman's right not going to do that because he's not even on social media anymore. <laughs> yeah, Pittman's not on social media, so, so he's he not can't read. Get rid of Enos just because you say he should. <laughs> and he's not going to fire Enos because you're in the middle of a season and you don't have another option right now. Even at the right end now. of the 
a year he's not going to do it. Because no. you've got to, as we said before, have time to install your system. Well, that was my point last week, Mike, when I said we're in a world of instant gratification, right? Where we're in a world where you see what, you know, what did I say last week? You see Coach Prime go out there and, you know, st start turning around a Colorado team that won one game last year. And, oh, they're winning, they're winning. By the way, they got blown out by yeah, Oregon this past week. Yeah, it turns week. completely on it. And now exactly. It, it, now it will go the other direction for a while. But that's just the way this thing works. Well, my point is I like Oklahoma is that they're, they're, we live in a world of instant gratification, Oklahoma. People think that you should immediately, if, if a bad game happens, get rid of everybody. If a good game happens, oh, you can keep them, right? You know, that's how, <laughs> that's how this world well, works Well, I think now. what they generally do is they go hide for a while. If, if it turns around, if Arkansas starts if they to win, win games, Ole Miss they and, just and won't Texas say anything, and they're going to sit back and wait till they lose again, whenever that is, and it will happen. And then they're back on after you again. And, and they're that, going to reemerge. That's not going away. Yeah. I, you just might as well accept it. It's there. It's not changing. It is what it is. Yeah, it is what it is. If you don't like it, maybe you should follow Sam Pittman and delete social media, right? Well, <laughs> if you do what my dad always said when I complained about it, and, and look, this isn't anything new. When I was a kid, the old men around town just stood around and yelled at you when you walked around. If you, I still remember <laughs> walk after a loss. I had a date. We didn't get to the to the theater soon enough, so we had to park a block away and walk down the downtown square to get to the theater. Okay. And all these guys are sitting on the park benches, and I'm walking along with my date, and this guy goes, "What's she doing with him? Does she realize what a bad football player? She that's embarrassing. Somebody should talk to her dad. And she shouldn't go out with that goofball. He's a loser. And I'm having to listen to you, this. You just have to walk by, and I didn't just walk by. You and, said something. Well. It's if somebody says a specific thing, and one guy toward the end of that said the wrong thing. He said, "Yeah, the, you, the last year's team they practice a lot harder than you guys did." And I turned around and I said, "Hey, bub, I was on both teams. We practice harder this year because we're not as good, and we have to practice harder. We lost eight seniors that were all good players. You don't just magically recreate that. Why don't you learn about how football works?" And then I just turned around and walked off. Nice. Nice. So, oh, there you go. I, but I don't. I didn't generally talk back to adults in my hometown. It was considered bad form. Yeah, that's what I was saying. But if I was they're like, over the top, you have a right to defend yourself. That was a bit over the top there. He got to you a little bit with that comment. And he didn't bother me when he said she shouldn't go out with me. It bothered me when he said we weren't practicing as hard because I knew that was baloney. <laughs> you didn't care that you were like, oh, oh yeah. yeah. When we were good the year before, we didn't practice hard at all. We had talent, you know. We just breezing right through this stuff. The next year it was like, blah, blah. We walk <laughs> off the practice board, feel dead, you know. And you just, you know, we did get better. We won our last three games and lost our first six and had one tie at the end. We, we finally improved, but it's just when you lose eight, we had eight starters that were seniors and they were all good players. What are you going to do? Yeah, what are you going to do? You're going to talk back to someone that tells you you didn't practice hard enough this year. I love it, Mike. I love your stories. And we'll end on that note. We'll see you next Monday to answer more of your questions.